although it's super early, I am up and ready to start my day. When you have a spouse that works nights and they come in at 3 a.m. to ask you whatever's on their mind and you wake up, it's really hard to fall back to sleep sometimes, especially if I went to bed already worrying about things. And oh, they're flying. Yesterday, what was on my mind when I went to bed is how fast those darn meat chicks are growing. That's a blessing. I want them to be growing fast and ready to process by eight weeks, but I have nowhere to put them yet. <laughs> this is one of the one of the very foundational rules of homesteading is you don't get animals until you have the infrastructure to hold them in. And I have it, I just haven't built it yet. So all night I was putting together the, the meat chicken tractor in my head over and over again. So this morning I'm up early, gonna go take a look at the chicks, get them fed, get them watered, because of course I was worrying about them running out of food and um, take a look at how hard it's gonna be to pull out the meat chicken tractor. Essentially what my meat chicken tractor is, is a, mm, looks like a greenhouse, like a hoop house, but it's a shade house. So it has a fabric-y, canvas -y type of a mesh um, that will allow, rain will go through it, um, a certain amount of sunshine will go through it, wind will be able to blow through it, all the good things that we want for our pasture and for our birds, but they should not be able to escape. This would not work well if you had high predator pressure on your farm, but we do not. I think it's because we're surrounded by open fields, um, or maybe it's the fact that we have 11 farm cats, so we don't have little rabbits running around or chipmunks or squirrels, and those are the types of things that lure in larger prey that could be dangerous to your chickens or other small animals on your farm. So all to say, this wouldn't work for everybody, but I am really crossing my fingers that it works for us. They get so nervous when I film them. Hoping that I can just fill this feeder while it's in place. And it looks like that is the case. That will be one less step. Sorry guys. These guys have completely mastered chicken nipple. Every time I come to fill these, they are completely empty. Wonderful sign. When you're processing your own chickens, you end up with, at the end of this, I'll end up with about 98 whole chickens, assuming everybody else survives until processing. So that's not like 20 pounds of chicken breast and X amount of pounds of chicken thighs. That is whole chickens. Whole chickens require some education and a little bit of a learning curve if you've not been real familiar with cooking whole chickens because suddenly you're not just dealing with a chicken breast that takes 20 minutes to thaw out and 10 minutes to cook. You actually have real whole chicken pieces <laughs> to deal with. Very rarely do I pull out four or five chickens and break them all down just so I can have a specific cut of meat for dinner. I typically cook with whole chickens. And it took me a while to get good at it. Um, what I've learned is you can put a whole chicken in an instant pot and you can cook it pretty quick depending on the size of the chicken, anywhere between, I would say 35 minutes and 55 minutes, and it's completely done. Now, is it pretty when it comes out of the Instant Pot? No, because it's not browned at all. Oh my gosh, you guys act like that's the only full waterer in the entire coop. It's not brown, the skin is just kind of white and ugly, but you can now take that chicken and pick it off the bone, which is what I do a lot of the time, to make chicken noodle soup or to make really anything that requires cooked chicken. Um, so that's probably the most often, most common method that I use um, when cooking my whole chickens. But we also have a rotisserie. It's a really good way to do it. And that looks just like a grocery store rotisserie chicken when you get it out. Um, tastes much better, much different. Um, but it looks like a rotisserie chicken you get at the grocery store. And that's something that goes over well with my kids and my family. What I don't do is a whole lot of 
what I used to do when I lived in Florida. Grilled chicken breast, homemade chicken nuggets, things like that because I'm not working with chicken breast. For every chicken that I process here, I'm getting two breasts off of it. That's it. So if I wanted to cook for my family and let's say I needed 14 chicken breasts, that would be 14, seven, that would be seven whole chickens I'd have to pull out of my freezer, cut, thaw out, cut the breast off, and work with. And then I'd have the rest of those chicken carcasses to, <laughs> to deal with. So it's just not feasible to feed your family that way when you are raising your own meat birds or when you're buying meat birds from another farmer. You're probably going to get whole chickens. So it's just better to learn how to cook with them and use every single part and every piece. When I'm done, let's say I am making chicken noodle soup, I actually start by using bone broth and do you think these chicks like to hear about all the different ways I'm going to cook them? <laughs> Probably not. But I actually start my chicken soup recipe by using bone broth. I have half gallon jars of bone broth, usually in the refrigerator, sometimes in the freezer, depending on how caught up I am. And that's the way this process starts and that's the way this recipe ends. So I pull out the bone broth. Be kind to your girlfriends. I pull out the bone broth heat that up. I add in my celeries, my onion, my carrots, and my cooked chicken that I pull out of the instant pot. And then I take all that carcass, all the scraps that are left, the skin, the bones, any fat, any meat I'm not using, I put it right back into the instant pot. Um, so now I have two instant pots going, one with my chicken soup in it and one with my start of my bone broth. Add in water and a little bit of apple cider vinegar and I set that for about an hour and 20 minutes on high pressure and that makes me a new batch of bone broth. So bone broth is similar to chicken broth, except that you're pulling all of those minerals out of the bones. And that's really a crazy thing to do. If you've done it right, at the very end, you strain your broth. So any bones that are left, any pieces of anything are strained out. And if you take one of those bones, let's say like a femur bone, that's pretty this long and you know pretty big, you can just take two fingers and crush it. The apple cider vinegar and the pressure cooking process pulls out all of the minerals out of the bone, um, pulls out a bunch of <clears throat> gelatin, things like that. So those bones, they're not even really bones anymore. They're just kind of a pile of mush. And that's why bone broth is so good for you because you're getting all the minerals and things that are inside of that bone. And you can make bone broth out of anything. Um, I typically only have a large amount of chicken bones. I don't have a lot of beef bones right now or anything else. So chicken bone broth is what we make. But then by the time my chicken soup is done, I also am replenishing my stock of bone broth back into the freezer, back into the refrigerator. And it's really something that's difficult to keep on my shelf. We use bone broth for everything. If I'm making rice, I'll make it with bone broth instead of water. If I'm making soup, any kind of soup, and I make a lot of soup, um, it almost always starts with a bone broth base. And if you're making it for the first time, don't be surprised when you pull it out of the refrigerator and it doesn't look like chicken broth. It's not always super liquidy. Sometimes, depending on what you've made it out of, it looks a whole lot more like cloudy, yellowish, whitish jello, <laughs> and it's all in one gelatinous chunk. And that sounds really disgusting and it kind of looks gross the first time, but I will promise you it makes the most amazing soup or anything else you add it into. And you can imagine how good that is for your bones, for your joints, things like that. All right, meat birds, fatten up so I can turn you into bone broth. They look good for the day. Saramas, what do you need? You need to learn your chicken nipple today is what you need. This is getting ridiculous. Your preschool counterparts are showing you up. They know how to use theirs. What's the situation over here? Hmm? Why can't we figure it out? Now to take a look at my meat bird chicken tractor. Hmm, not great news. Got a lot of obstacles. I've got the bale of hay to deal with. I've got the bikes in the bike rack. And I think the meat chicken tractor is this cardboard box right here. And I think it kind of weighs a lot. Debating if I should wait for the boys to wake up or try to tackle it on my own. Oh my gosh, are you serious? How can this be that difficult? I don't 
don't want to get paint on my hand. Okay, how about the bottom of my foot? <laughs> There we go, that's the ticket. Okay, new rollers. All right, here we are up in the office looking for the email from Justin Rhodes with the mini me plans. All right, here we go. Page three, we have all the supplies with links that should bring us to Lowe's, I think. Okay, <clears throat> starting with some of the hardware one and a half inch corner braces. Let's see what that is. All right. This is so easy. I'm loving this. All right, I need 12 of those. Honestly, this could not be easier. All right. We are putting together the meat tractor. On the other side. All right, getting ready to put together the meat bird tractor. These are the directions we're working with. Not a single word on them, but a lot of little steps. All right, so guys, we're going to build it this way. It's long and narrow. It's going to go out this way. So basically the parts that I need are all the number seven laid out this way. One line here, one line here. Ah. 